This morning I have a word for the people of God. I have a word for the church. It's not really a word for the lost. It is a word for the church, for us, people of God. Second Chronicles, Solomon and the children of Israel have built the temple and they have a great time of celebration and praise and the glory of God comes down in such a powerful way that it says that the priest could not even stand to minister. What an awesome thing. What a fantastic experience that must have been. It was certainly a mountaintop. It was such an achievement to have finished the temple, but then to have such an experience in the presence of the Lord. But as wonderful as that time was, um, we all know that things don't always stay in that mountaintop experience. And in our land right now, it's definitely a difficult time. But it's during this great experience that they've just had that the Lord speaks this to Solomon. It is as if to say, there will come difficult days ahead. And here's what he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and we're going to read 13 and 14. He says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among the people... If my people, who were called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What an amazing promise that the Lord would heal our land. He says that this is about His people. That's us. We are his people. Now, there are some people who want to say, along with all of the other promises, that they want to say that this promise is not really for us, that it was only for Solomon and for that group of people at that particular time. But I believe that the truths, the principles of the Scripture are eternal and that they speak to every generation. And... The principles that are found here in verse 14 are just as much for us as it was for those to whom it was spoken. In fact, I don't believe at all that it was recorded in Scripture in the Word of God for their sake, but for ours. So that we would know what we're supposed to do when difficult days come. How we need the Lord to heal our land. He's the only one who can. Heal our land, literally, from sickness. Heal our land from financial upheaval. Heal our land from violence and racism and people who have become so divisive and angry all the time looking for a fight. Jesus said in the last days in Matthew 24, 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. I don't think that we are seeing the final fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy, but I believe that we are seeing a portion of that, and that's common in prophecy that sometimes there is a little bit that happens along the way, and I'm telling you that we're seeing a partial fulfillment of that prophecy that the love of many has grown cold. The love for God and love for others, it's grown cold. And there is this great increase of wickedness in this generation. Hatred, murder, sexual immorality, racism. Greed, all kinds of wickedness. In my 60 years, I personally have never 
seen a time when there's been so much strife and conflict and division in our land, we're no longer united by our commonalities, the things that we share in common with not only other Americans, but even other believers, but rather we are divided by all of our differences. Such division, such conflict. What happened to treating others with respect and dignity regardless of their age or their race or their political views? or even their beliefs. Now, everybody has this defensive posture where if somebody has a different opinion, then we think that our rights and our freedoms and even our beliefs are being threatened and they're going to be taken away. We talk about the world around us being so easily offended, especially us baby boomers. You know, we like to talk about the younger generations as, you know, all their bunch of little sissies, you know, they're so easily offended about everything. I'm going to tell you the truth this morning. As a pastor, what I see is that there is nobody more easily offended than believers. We get offended about everything. And don't misunderstand me. There's a lot to be offended about in this culture. But oh, do we get offended. We get upset and we get mad. You turn on Christian talk radio and they say, you're under attack. We have to defend ourselves and fight. And that sounds right. In fact, I know some of you are tempted to say amen right then. It sounds right. The apostles lived in such a horrible time where, you know, we we always think, oh, how wonderful it must have been to be with Jesus, to walk with Jesus. Well, Well, it was a horrible time. So much violence and wickedness and so much persecution. They were under constant attack. Some of them were put in prison. Some of them were killed. They were stoned. All kinds of terrible things happened to them. But they didn't resort to fighting in the flesh. Ever since Peter cut a guy's ear off in the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus put it back on, They didn't do that anymore. But what they did do is they fought in prayer. And let me tell you something. They won. The Bible says that they turned the world upside down. They didn't do it by fighting with flesh. They did it by fighting a spiritual fight. That's where the real battle is. Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. And I'm telling you, this is a spiritual battle. It has to be fought in the spirit by spiritual people, not by carnal people fighting in the flesh. It has to be fought in the spirit by spiritual people. That's where the battle is won or lost. Y'all are getting quiet on me already, but I'm I'm just telling you, we got to get this. It is not about a fight in the flesh. It is about a fight in the spirit. That's where the battle is won. And all how we need to heed the word of the Lord this morning. This battle has to be fought in prayer. We need the Lord to heal our land. See, our our battles are... (laughs) I don't know where people get this idea that battles are won by who can yell the loudest. (laughs) 
No. I'm telling you, we need the Lord to heal our land. One man said, men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they're helpless against our prayers. I'm just telling you, there's no limit to the power of God when we pray. A lot of people are saying, you know, here's their prayer. They're praying, Lord, why don't you do something? Like, we're waiting on God, okay? Lord, why don't you do something? We're just waiting on God. But what if, what if he's waiting on us? What if it's up to us? It really is up to us. It's not up to the world. It's not up to the government. It's up to us. He said, if my people, if my people, that's us. That's us. It's a wonderful thing to be the people of God, for him to say, my people, and he's talking about us. That's a wonderful thing. But we need to hear it this morning. He's saying, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. He said, if, if. You see, the promises are not automatic. Most of them have a condition, and they all are appropriated by faith. But in this verse, if is a really big word. If, if, God heal our land. Listen, if my people, we the church, the people of God, the church is the only thing down here going up there. The church, even the gates of hell can't stop the church, I'm telling you, we think there's nothing we can do. <laughs> no, we as the church, we're the ones that need to humble ourselves and pray. In Genesis chapter 18, it tells the story about how when the Lord decided to destroy the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he told Abraham about what he was about to do. Abraham was his friend, and he told him about what he was going to do. And Abraham began to intercede for these wicked cities. And he said, what if there's 50 righteous there? Will you not destroy them? And the Lord says, no, I won't destroy them if there's 50 righteous. He got all the way down to 10. If there's just 10 righteous people in these two huge wicked cities, and the Lord said, no, if there's ten righteous, I won't destroy these wicked cities. I want you to think about this. Two huge wicked cities. And God says, if there's just ten righteous, He'll spare both cities completely. But you know the story. There wasn't even ten. There was only Lot and his family. And so the angel of the Lord led Lot and his family out safely. And then the cities were destroyed. But I want you to understand this. When God said that he would not destroy the two cities if there were just ten righteous, listen, it was not because of all of the huge number of people. No, he was going to destroy them. He did. It was not because of all of the innocent children of those pagans. No. He did. When he said that he would not, it was because of his people. If there were just ten righteous people in those cities, he would have spared them all. And it was because of the prayer, the intercession of his friend Abraham. Don't tell me there's nothing we can do because of this wicked culture we live in. He says, if my people... Call by my name. I've been saying it. It's time for the church to shine. It's time for the church to come together in unity and faith and stand on the promises of God. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. And we just finished a few weeks back a, a series on pride. But I have to remind you of some things this morning. I think not only 
is it found here in this verse that we have to humble ourselves, but it, it is just such a key issue in the time that we're living. James 4, 6 tells us, the scripture says that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Listen, we want God to heal our land. He resists the proud, but he helps. He gives unearned favor, help to the humble. This is such a key issue. If we want God to heal our land, he says that we are to humble ourselves. You know, one of the biggest problems in our land right now is that we as a people, as a nation, have become so prideful. We are all so sure that we are right. And I keep wondering, when God heals our land... Who's going to take the credit? Because I can assure you there's going to be a long line of politicians and people trying to take the credit for what God did, for what we prayed that God would do. It's nothing but pride. And we need to know better. I'm talking about the people of God. We need to know better. But he's the only one who can and we've got to pray and we've got to believe him and we've got to put away our pride in thinking that we can do it on our own. You know, the scripture says, in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction. Well, there's so much destruction taking place right now in our land and it is directly related to the pride problem. The scripture says in Proverbs 13, 10, by pride comes nothing but strife. So much strife and conflict and division. Pride is deceptive. It makes you think that you are right even when you're wrong. And pride causes us to think that we're better than others. And the truth is, is that sometimes we as believers are the worst about thinking that we're better than others. There's that temptation right there. Well, surely I'm better than that. Surely I'm better than those people. Only by the grace of God. And we start looking down and judging other people, thinking too highly of ourselves. We need to remember where our righteousness comes from, that it is totally by faith and not anything that we ourselves have done. We can't allow ourselves to have a prideful attitude and self-righteousness. Remember the story of the two men that Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 10. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed Thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And I want you to know there's a real danger for us there when we start thinking that we are better than others and we look down on them in our pride and what is self-righteousness. We are not even right with God because you can only be righteous by faith. It's not about how good you are. No, there's none good, none righteous, only by the blood of Jesus. We like to talk about the sins of the world as though we ourselves are sinless. I would ask for a show of hands to see how many are sinless, but I did have a man tell me one time that he didn't sin. I was like, wow, that's amazing because the scripture says in 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We all sin. We know we're not perfect. The difference between us and the lost is that we have been saved, delivered by the shed blood 
of the Lord Jesus. And they haven't yet. That's the difference between us and them. And the scripture says that it's not anything that we have done. And there's no place for boasting. So how dare we ever stand in judgment of the lost and think that we are better than them? How we need to humble ourselves. I'm not talking to the lost. I'm talking to the people of God. That we need to humble ourselves. I don't understand why Christians talk about the lost with judgment and indignation and anger. Read the Gospels. Jesus never, never did that. Not one time will you find where he spoke to the lost or about them with judgment and indignation and anger. The Pharisees did that. Who do we want to be like? Jesus told the religious people in John 8, 15, He said, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. I'm just leaving that out there. If my people will humble themselves. Oh, how we need to get the pride out. We need to admit we cannot heal our land on our own. We desperately need the Lord's help. But we also need to be humble enough that we will let God deal with us. We pray for God to change our nation, but we also need to pray that God will change us, that, he, that we will be humble enough to be pliable in His hands so that we can be an agent of change in this world that He can work through. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, if my people will pray, my people will pray. Not fight with flesh and blood and argue and rant and post and tweet, but pray. I mean, what if we took all that time and all that effort and energy and we put it into prayer? You know what would really be amazing, an amazing thing in our generation is if people would just go on a social media fast, we would have all kinds of time for prayer. We just do, do with a little less of our evening entertainment maybe. We'd have a lot more time for prayer. If my people will pray. We want God to heal our land. He says, if my people will pray. And I'm telling you, the sovereign God and Lord of all creation chooses to wait for somebody to pray before he moves. You know, the devil doesn't mind if we talk about prayer or teach about it. We can even have prayer meetings as long as we don't pray. I've been to prayer meetings where they taught on prayer and talked about prayer, but didn't hardly pray at all. I've been to prayer meetings where they talked about the problems more than they prayed. What's important is that we pray. Such a waste when people don't pray. You know, in our time, it makes people upset if somebody doesn't vote. They say, what a waste. What a waste. You didn't vote. No, that may be a waste. But when you don't pray, it's huge. Huge. Because i got to tell you, no matter who you vote in, and don't misunderstand me, you should vote for a righteous man, a man of character and integrity, according to the Scripture. That's what the Scripture teaches. Not vote for a man who represents your interest. Vote for a righteous man. A man of integrity and character. But no matter who you elect, they're not the answer. He is the answer. He's the only one that can do this. How we need God to truly heal our land. And how we waste the awesome power of prayer. Prayer is what changes things because it brings the power of the Almighty into our world. 
Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty two through 24, Have faith in God, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray and believe you receive, you will have them. Mountain-moving prayers. Such power is available when we pray and believe. That's how we bring God's power into this world. That's why he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Why do we try things that don't work? Why do we just keep doing the same things over and over that don't work? I'm telling you, we will never change anything by complaining. And most of us are really good at it because we've had a lot, a lot of experience at it. And we say, well, I don't seem to be very good at praying. Well, you know what? We just need to do it some more and we'll get good at it. But we need to pray and pray and pray. Complaining doesn't work. Let's do this instead. Talk negatively. We get all upset about all the immorality in our country, illegal drugs, all the crime, all the violence and injustice. We talk about this godless society Listen, talking negative about it doesn't change anything. It doesn't work. What works is prayer. That's where the power is. We say, well, there's nothing we can do. Yes, there is. We can pray. That's not nothing. That's everything. Prayer changes things. We pray. We pray. For his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is is in heaven. We're praying that Jesus' reign and rule will come into our lives and into our world. But I'm telling you, prayer is so powerful. It gives us access to the throne of grace where there is great power. Here's another one that doesn't work. Worry. We can just go over it and over it and over it in our minds and it will wear you out. I so appreciated the message that Pastor Jonathan brought last week. I hope that you're living that out in your life and getting free from worry. Philippians 4, 6 says we're not to be anxious about anything, but to pray about everything. Prayer is what works. So pray instead of worry. Pray instead of complain. Pray instead of fighting with flesh and blood. I tell you, the Lord can heal our land, but we have to pray. He said, if my people will seek my face. You see, we can't be looking to the government. We can't be looking to man. We can't be looking to money. We've got to be looking to God. He's the answer. Why would we look anywhere else? To seek His face means that we are pursuing Him. It means that we're going after Him, seeking to know Him, to be intimate with Him. You know, when I see that seek His face, it reminds me of Moses and how the Bible says that he would speak to God face to face as a man with his friend. To seek His face is to go after that kind of closeness with the Lord. Enough of this casual seeking. He says, you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. They talk about the seeker-friendly church. We all got to be a seeker-friendly church. I want to tell you the the problem with that is, is it's really about casual seekers. And nobody finds God casual, casually seeking you got to seek Him with all your heart and then He promises that you will find Him. And I'm telling you that we as the people of God need to get to that place where we are truly seeking His face, seeking His presence, seeking to be with Him, be close to Him. Whatever happened, to people praying, sometimes for hours, especially in times like these. Whatever happened to people going to prayer meetings? Whatever happened to people 
coming to the front at the end of a service. And I know this is a strange time right now. We're not doing prayer partners and all of that. But I'm not even talking about prayer partners. I'm talking about whatever happened to people just wanting to come and just seek God. And we act like it's just, just a cultural thing. You know, church culture changes. And I understand that, but we've lost some things somewhere along the way. That passion for seeking God, just wanting to be closer to Him. And He says, if my people will seek my face. And then He says, if my people will turn from their wicked ways. Now we all know we haven't arrived yet. We're not perfect. We all need change in certain areas. And if you don't think so, then you need to allow the Holy Spirit to show you. But if my people will turn from their wicked ways. You see, the real problem is not the wickedness of Hollywood nor the sinfulness of our politician. The real problem is the compromise and the hypocrisy among believers Believers talk about the filth of Hollywood and then they go home and watch it or they pay money to go to the theater and see it. I'm preaching good right now. And we complain about how filthy it is while we turn it on and watch it. There's something wrong with that. It's time for the people of God to turn away from pornography. It's time for the people of God to turn away from drinking I figured that would go over just about like that. That's all right. Preacher's gone to meddling. I've gone to preaching. It's time for the people of God to turn away from their pride and truly humble themselves. It's time for the people of God to turn away from their greed. Enough of this covetousness and the continual lust for more. The Bible says it's idolatry. It's time for us to turn away from such hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, like where we, we complain and complain and complain about how that they've taken prayer out of the school. The only prayer they took out of the school was somebody leading your kid to pray. The real issue is, is they're not being taught to pray at home. We want the school to teach them the Bible. By the way, I never wanted any... I don't want the schools deciding who's teaching my kid the Bible. The Bible says that we're to teach our kids the Bible. Parents teach their kids the Bible. And what hypocrisy for us to say the school needs to do it. We need to do it. Boy, I feel popular right now. Oh, man. Thank you. Because I was feeling lonely, too. (laughs) I'm just telling you. We live in a time where there's so many compromises, things that have become acceptable to Christians, gossip and slander, telling little lies, greed, covetousness, bitterness, rage, lust, all kinds of impurity. It all seems to be acceptable to so many. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Oh, you're dearly loved. You're His people. He says to live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I want to tell you that what keeps us from reaching people, it's not the ungodly. It's not the atheist. They can't stop our message. They can't stop the move of God. It is when instead of living a life of love and acting like Jesus, we act like religious people and hypocrites. In fact, if you ever listen to the world, you know what they say about us and why they don't want to be one of us? The The most often, most common remark is that we're hypocrites. And I know that many times that accusation is unjustified. I also know that too often it is not. But he goes on in verse 3, he says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, not even a hint or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Who are we? We're the people of God. We are God's holy people. 
This is who we are. Nor should there be any obscenity or foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. I've been around Christian men sometime who were not embarrassed to tell a dirty joke in front of me. And I go to the gym and where there's ungodly people who are lost and they find out that I'm a, a preacher, they wouldn't dare tell a dirty joke in front of me. Something's wrong. These things are improper for God's holy people. This is who we are. How is it that this is not being preached? Those things are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. God's holy people. That's us. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Holy. First of all, I want to point out to you that God is saying this as a command. Be holy, for I am holy. Some people want to say this is just a positional thing. I certainly understand the blood of Jesus and that it's the blood of Jesus that washes us from sin. But we need to understand when, when he commands us to be holy, he's talking about our lifestyle. In fact, in verse 15, he says, be holy in all of your conduct. And we make compromises and act so much like the world so much of the time. It's time for us to get serious about really living for God. and Really seeking God. Really getting close to God. And really praying like it matters. And humbling ourselves before the Lord. My people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Here's the fantastic promise. I will hear. He's going to hear that prayer. And he's going to forgive. And he's going to heal our land. I really believe this church, that we as the people of God, we can see this happen. That God will heal our land. And I want to ask you, church, to stand with me and to pray with me and to believe with me. And let's see this done. Not just this morning. We're going to stand and pray right now. But not just this morning. But stand. Be standing in prayer and fight this fight. And let's see it happen. Let's see God heal our land. Stand with me. Stand with me. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you never just leave us... (laughs) where we are, but you call us onward and upward and closer to you. And I pray, Father, that today that every person in this room will answer that call. Every person in this room, Lord, will decide that they're going to be a part of the answer, a part of what you're doing in this world. Oh, and Father, I pray the Holy Spirit would help us to see where we need to change. Help us to see, Father, If there is some wicked way in us, show us by your Holy Spirit and give us the grace, Father, to leave it behind and to live a life that truly glorifies you. Father, we ask you as the people of God this morning, we humble ourselves, Lord, and we ask you, Father, to heal our land. We say it boldly that you're the only one who can. Lord, we just ask you, That you would work in us that which is effectual and necessary, Lord, to bring it to pass. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.